most people would probably assume perinatal health to focus on just this period of pregnancy. But I would say that it's really much more comprehensive than that. Ensuring that the community can be well because we are taking care of the mom and the baby and the needs of the family. And if you look at that framework that has been designed by DC Health, it really touches on all the different investments that have been made by the mayor. And we really want to make sure that people understand the resources that are available to them. When I first became pregnant, my number one concern was finding medical care where I felt like I would have more of a voice in what I wanted. That is half the battle right there, just raising that level of awareness that we do have services and support for you. I mean, we are a caring community and we are here. We're not going anywhere and we're serving all of our district residents, not specific cultures, not specific communities. We're here for everyone. Quality care does exist in the District of Columbia. I am proof of it. I provide it every day at Mary Center. Here at Community of Hope, we're working with women and families who need help from all the little basic, simple things as filling out paperwork to get WIC support, from helping to make sure her insurance is, you know, um, still active. We need to have that, you know, support in-house to help women. It's about having all these pieces and having a staff that mirrors them is really, really important. With me, it was difficult for me to navigate the healthcare system and articulate myself in such a way that I was getting my questions answered. So the wonderful thing about the Nest was that I was now giving the tools to be able to track and understand what types of things were gonna be expected to be happening to my body. As a new mother, those are things that I think a lot of other mothers take for granted. Even the OBGYNs kind of have the expectation that you kind of know what to expect, and you don't. You don't really know what to expect what you're expecting. The Stork's Nest helps women to know ahead of time what they are going to experience. We show the mom how to take care of the baby. We connect with other agencies and organizations that can support her after the baby is born. With this being Mayor Bowser's second annual National Maternal and Infant Health Summit, we're not only talking about our local investments and our local innovation and the things that we're thinking about, but we're able to also couple that with other best practices that are happening nationally in order to move the needle forward. I am super thrilled that the mayor has started having these summits. I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn about each other and learn what everybody is offering. Um, and try to really work on creating best practices. I do feel more optimistic that we're gonna finally start to dismantle these systems and make change. The mayor is extremely committed to it, and I think her as a mom with Miranda right in tow, I think it's really exciting. It's a cliche, but it's the truth. Children really are the future. So it really is an investment in our society, and really it helps get our country and community strengthened. For me, this is ministry to help other people to realize that it takes a whole village to raise a child and that we all play a part in helping to keep it healthy and that we can make a difference. What makes me really feel good about the work that I'm doing is that um, <laughs> I'm responding to a calling. Um, it's hard to do this work but the commitment that is needed to continue to do it is real. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the mayor of Washington, D.C., the Honorable Muriel Bowser. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, please. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the National Maternal and Infant Health Summit right here in Washington, D.C. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, this morning, and throughout the day. Uh, we have a series of very important uh, discussions about how to make sure in the district uh, that we have healthy moms and healthy babies, uh, and that what we share, what we learn with our counterparts across the nation. So we know that we're showing up today in large, large numbers for women and babies 
and their fathers and everyone else impacted by our, our nation's maternal health crisis. Last year, when we decided to host this summit, one of the reasons for doing so was to bring attention to an issue that affects families and communities here in D.C. and across the nation. A researcher at Harvard School of Public Health recently described the issue of maternal deaths in the United States as a public health crisis that has been hiding in plain sight for more than 30 years. And this is the reason we come together again, because it is on all of us, whether we're a woman or a man, whether we have children or never plan to, regardless of our race, we all have a role to play in turning this crisis around. As the mayor of a major city, I know the issue of maternal health is about equity. It's an issue that gets to the heart of how we focused and fun issues that are important to women, and especially to black women. Of course, though serving as mayor of my hometown is only part of my stake in the issue. As you know, just 15 months ago, I was blessed through adoption to become the mother of a beautiful baby girl, baby Miranda. And every day since, I hold her in my arms, I look at her and I look, she looks up at me and I know we're in it together uh, and she has certainly been the light of my life. But like so many people, just the responsibility, the anxiety and the stress of making sure I get it right occupies many of my woken and sleeping moments. To watch her grow up and discover the world and to watch her reach developmental milestones um, is happening so fast. So as we come together today, um, but because we believe that every family, regardless of how that family came together or how big the family is or whether the family was planned or unplanned, every family should have a positive experience welcoming a child into the world and not one fraught with fear and sadness. So my team uh, has been really laser focused since we left last year on making sure that we're building the infrastructure in DC government, among our provider communities, among our healthcare um, companies and organizations and nonprofits to support our families. So we put forth a series of tough questions. How do we increase access for all of our residents to healthy food, to safe housing, and to clean air and water? How do we build safer neighborhoods so that we can reduce the amount of stress and trauma on our residents? How do we make sure that more of our families aren't losing fathers and brothers and grandparents and children to senseless violence or to the criminal justice system? How do we ensure that every woman in our community has convenient access to gynecologists and obstetricians? And there are so many other questions that I'm sure will come up throughout the day. Today and every day, we continue to sound the alarm about maternal mortality rates in our nation and how African Americans are disproportionately affected. We also recognize that the health of women and families does not begin and end with pregnancy, and that in both our communities and our bodies, the dangers that we face are obvious. So we commit to proactively finding and addressing those dangers. Since last year, uh, in our summit, we've created the Thrive by Five Coordinating Council, led by Dr. Faith Gibson Hubbard, who you will hear from next. Together with our recently assembled maternally, Maternal Mortality Review Committee, as well as our newly established Commission on Healthcare Systems Transformation, Faith and her team are doing the important work in identifying gaps in our system and making sure the entirety of our government uh, is behind getting those gaps addressed. 
You're going to hear from Faith shortly, and we'll begin our first panel. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge so many people who have been a part of making sure this framework is going to be successful for D.C. families. Um, let me first acknowledge one of our very important um, partners from the Council of the District of Columbia, at-large council member Anita Bonds. Thank you for always being here, Anita, to support families. I also want to acknowledge members of my senior team, uh, the city administrator, Rashad Young, the chief of staff and deputy mayor for economic development, John Falchicchio, the deputy mayor for education, Paul Kine, the deputy mayor for health and human services, Wayne Turnage. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the director of, the, of DC Health, Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt. Thank you, LaQuandra, and your team for all that you have done. I also want to acknowledge several of our cabinet members who are here, our DHCD Director Polly Donaldson, our African American Affairs Director Ashley Emerson, our Chief Medical Office, um, Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Roger Mitchell, um, our CFSA Director Brenda Donald, uh, Jennifer Porter who leads Fatherhood Men and Boys, I'm sorry, Women Policy Initiatives, Christy Whitfield, who leads DSLBD, Jennifer Smith, uh, who, uh, who heads our crime lab and our public uh, health labs, and all that we do at DFS. So these are members of the Bowser administration whose responsibility is not women and babies, um, but everything we do is about women and babies, um, and that's why they are here to support um, these events today. So with that, let me turn to uh, Faith, uh, and then we will get busy with our first panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Director of Thrive by Five, Dr. Faith Gibson Hubbard. Wow, so good morning. <laughs> and welcome to Mayor Bowser's second National Maternal and Infant Health Summit. It is so exciting to see everybody in the room today as we were setting up over the last couple days. I was wondering if all these chairs are gonna be filled and now I see that they are um, for such a great cause. And I'm really honored to stand here with you today as we stand together in support of moms and babies. We are convened here together to find ways forward to support all moms, babies, and families being healthy, happy, and whole. As um, The Voice just said, I am Dr. Faith Gibson Hubbard, and it is truly a privilege to serve as the mayor's first executive director of the Thrive by Five Coordinating Council. You see, Thrive by Five is the manifestation of the conversations that happened at last year's summit. Our mayor heard from you, and from that, Thrive by Five was born. And we are the city's first comprehensive initiative focused on maternal health, early learning, and the health of our very youngest DC residents from birth to age five. We work in close partnership with many of the agencies that you heard the mayor just mention and our non-governmental partners in order to spark the collaboration, innovation, and coordination that our families so desperately deserve and that they've told us that they've wanted for so long. So I could talk to you about all the different things that Thrive by Five is doing, but we're actually not here for that today. Um, so I will definitely direct you to our Thrive by Five website at thrivebyfive.dc.gov and ask you to take a look at the things that we're doing and the upcoming work of our Thrive by Five Coordinating Council, which in a very exciting way has eight seats for parents. And so that lets you know just how committed our mayor is to hearing from parents and them being the experts in the room in order to move our city forward. So I want to pause here and thank a few folks and our partners um, who have helped to make today possible. So I want to say thank you to Aetna, Johnson & Johnson, MedStar, Amerigroup, Sibley Hospital, Children's National, AmeriHealth, the George Washington University Hospital, and March of Dimes. Your partnership has been instrumental in making today happen. I also want to give a huge thank you to someone who's always behind the scenes, uh, Mr. Lamont Aikens with <laughs> the Mayor's Office on Community Affairs. He has really been my partner in this journey. I want to also thank DC Health, 
I want to thank OSSI and their Division of Early Learning for their support, as well as the Mayor's Office on Women's Policy Initiatives for all the support as we've been on our Maternal Mondays journey, and also to my colleagues in the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services for your support. And most importantly, I want to thank Tiffany Wilson, who was a part of the Thrive by Five team. It's been the two of us really moving things forward, and without you, I'm not sure that I would have been able to make today possible. Now that I've said all of that, I want to return back to the comments that the mayor made. She did a great job of summarizing exactly why we're back here today. And while we can definitely celebrate the improvements we've made forward, we are still very much in crisis mode. We are back here today because this event this summit today should be the start of our call to action again and the activation of our collective action because we all are responsible in order for ensuring that our moms and babies are well. You can pick up any newspaper, log on to any social media site, or even turn on your TV and hear about the stories that families have had to endure. The statistics and negative outcomes that we hear, particularly for black moms and babies, are no longer surprising trends. We have to really take a look at ourselves and say, what are we doing to move things forward? There are things that government can do and there are definitely investments that our great mayor is making, but what role are you playing in moving today forward and moving this particular issue to one that we no longer have to worry about? About a month ago, I sent a letter out to you sharing my story about becoming a mom and the journey was not easy. I had many of the same outcomes that we hear from moms that we otherize often. But when I was in that room birthing my daughter for the second time, this is my second pregnancy, I could have ended up exactly the same as many other moms that we hear from so often. So we have to share our stories and we have to be willing to listen to the, others, the stories of others in order to move us forward. I hope that we will take today to see ourselves in the stories of others and see how those stories can really move us forward. The conversations that we start here today can spark new possibilities. And many of the panels that you'll see come after are about motherhood, fatherhood, risk and resilience, food policy, and the role of fathers are just the start. This afternoon, we will also have breakout sessions, which we hope will really focus more on our local investments, and we can really dig in and start that collective action together. In addition to the great conversations that we'll be having here on the main stage, we are also having the Health and Early Learning Expo, which I hope you'll continue to go back to all day. We should be connecting you to all the wonderful resources that we have in the district, and there should be no hidden programs in the District of Columbia when you leave here, because we have made sure that you can connect to those through the DC Maternal Health, um, com website, and also through the resources that we have here today. So before I get off the stage, I want to once again thank Mayor Bowser for your leadership and thank you for the opportunity to serve for a way that's not just personal for me, but also is now really tied to my professional interests. It is truly an honor and it is an honor to share this day and this space with each of you. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderators for our first panel. Executive Director of Thrive by Five, Dr. Faith Gibson Hubbard, and the Director of the Mayor's Office on Women's Policy and Initiatives, Jennifer Porter. Morning. morning. I have an exciting panel lined up this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Churches of the CEO of American Association of University Women. <laughs> Chef and TV personality and author, Patty Jenich and Dr. Esker Gamarachi Medzavire, OBGYN, Atrium Health. Good morning, 
ladies, and thank you so much for being here. This is such an amazing opportunity to have a conversation with power moms in the room. Thank you for being here. Um, the um, the uh, awesome bios of our phenomenal speakers are in the program book and on the website. And when you have time, take a look and see the phenomenal things these women are doing. They're global leaders, they are physicians, and by far and large, they are moms. And so we're so excited to have a conversation today with you all about how you show up as moms in your careers. Uh, chef Patty, I'll start with you. You have cooked as a chef around the world, at the White House for President Obama, and in front of 31,000, excuse me, 31 million families on your show. Um, but your biggest responsibility is cooking for your little ones in your home. Tell us a little bit about how you show up for them as a mom. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. This is such an honor, and in such a great panel, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I think you're asking such a like, powerful, important question because how you show up, you show up in so many ways. We were just talking about how being a mom and being a working mom, there's really no balance. There's really no having it all. There's, just, there's making it every day at a time, but showing up for your kids in so many ways. So for us, the dinner table is the most important time. And it's showing up at the dinner table in many ways, not only having food at the table, which can be a, a big challenge on any Wednesday night, but also for us being Mexican-Americans. You know, I was born in Mexico, moved here 20 years ago, became an American, and now I'm Mexican-American, dual citizenship, but my kids are American. And we talk all the time about how we have a double responsibility we have a double blessing of inheriting from two different cultures, two different countries, but we have a double responsibility in doing right by Mexico and representing Latinos and Hispanos in the US, but mostly by showing how we enrich America. And we do... <laughs> and through the noble lens of food is an amazing way to do it. Because when you think about Mexican food, Latin food, we're just giving what we've got. We're giving our ingredients, we're giving our love, we're giving our, our fuel. So at the table, I'm sharing with my kids food that their cousins in Mexico may be eating in Mexico City, the flan, the tacos. It's so incredibly satisfying to see that there's a hashtag Taco Tuesday and that America <laughs> is embracing Mexican food, regardless of what the political atmosphere may be, people love Mexican food. <laughs> and <laughs> they love what we bring to the table. It's not only the food and connecting them to their pride of where they come from, but what they can give to America, but also everything that surrounds the table for us, which is, it is the moment to talk. It is the moment to share. It is the moment to have people over. When our door is always open, there's always gonna be an extra taco. There's no starting time. There's no ending time. There's always gonna be more salsa in there for anybody. So it's about the food. It's about the connection. It's about no matter what's going on and what challenges there may be for work, for the show, for fundraising, for delivering to our partners. I, you know, we all have extremely stressful jobs. You're there, you're present for your kids, you're giving them food, you're connecting them to the culture. And the most important thing is you show up. So as we launch into today's discussions, I think one of the things that has been mentioned as a thread is really connecting with our own narrative. And as each of you as moms, what has been a part of your experience either in birthing your children or in also being able to continue to show up and be who you are in your spaces and stand up for moms really resonates most with you. I know, Dr. Esther, we had a really great conversation on yesterday, which really blessed me. And so um, just to share a little bit about what are those things that um, keep coming up in your narrative that help you show up for moms. And then, Kim, if you like to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, it's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here, both as a mother and a practicing OBGYN. 
Um, it's difficult for me actually to sit and figure out which way to answer this question because I've experienced it both ways. Um, my history is that I had a very high-risk pregnancy with my son unexpectedly. He ended up being delivered at 24 weeks. He was one pound when he was born. Um, they gave him a 40% chance of survival. They said that if he survived, we were pretty much guaranteed that he was either going to be blind, deaf, developmental disabilities, cerebral palsy. I was at the other end this time. I was the patient. I had the education behind me, but that all goes away when you're at the other end of it. And you're facing now the decisions that you have to make, not just for you, but for this person that is inside of you. That has changed my perspective completely on how I practice medicine. 24 weeks is the cusp of viability. So at that point, and this was 13 years ago, you actually could decide whether you wanted to proceed or not. You're counseled, and then you have to think about it. And this is when I sometimes think that as providers, we have to think, how do we talk to the patient? I had great care. And I don't hold against anybody what they said or how they said it because they were correct. But the question that was posed to my husband and I was, well, how much disability are you willing to accept? That's a tough question. And I thought to myself, this child didn't choose that. So whatever comes, however this child is going to be, we're going to love him and we're going to take care of him and that is our job. The second thing was my mother was in the room, and you get to see your mother and mothers in a completely different light. This mother's in a, she's an amazing woman, and my mother's a physical therapist, and when they left, she looked to me and she said, I was waiting to hear what you guys were going to say. And I said, well, why? And she goes, because if you don't want him, I'll take him. After that boy was born, he didn't give us the choice about whether to resuscitate it or not, because he didn't need it. <laughs> He's continued to be a fighter. We didn't want anyone to know that I was a physician, because we didn't want to be treated any different. Um, the experience that we are talking about is one that I then eventually had with my daughter, who was also a preemie, but not as bad as my son, in the intensive care unit. When we talk about maternal morbidity and mortality, and we talk about the disparity, it's very exciting to me because this is a watershed moment. This was our dirty little secret before, and now we can talk about it. And we're not squirming in our seats, we're not all looking down, we can make eye contact and say, there is a problem. We can put race, and we can put gender, maternal morbidity and mortality, and talk about it. When we were talking about risk factors, I was an interesting patient because I had the education. I had the resources. I had everything, and yet I still fell into judgment. When my daughter was in the intensive care unit, after the experience with my son, my husband said, well, you know, he just wanted to feel like he did something. He's, he's the, the dad, and he's like, I want to do something. I said, okay. And he said, well, ask them, what kind of formula does the baby need when she goes home? I said, well, okay, fine, no problem, because he wanted to get ready. And so I asked. Now, this person had been beating up on me and beating up on me and beating up on me all day. You've got to understand that there's now this, what we call the fourth trimester. The fourth trimester, woman is feeling vulnerable, right? I'm already hormonal, I already feel like I didn't do something right, I had an early baby. And so I asked, well, what kind of formula is the baby going to go home on so we can get ready? And the response was, why? It's not like Wick's going to cover it anyway. Oh. The assumption was made right there. And I think to myself, I think I speak pretty good English. I think I present myself as educated. My husband would come from work in his suit to see the baby. And if you're going to talk to me this way, how are you talking to that other lady who doesn't look like me, who doesn't speak as well as I do, who doesn't have the resources that I have? And then 
why are we shaming each other? This was a woman talking to me. Why are you shaming someone who's looking for help? And so this is what I work towards when I see my patients now. I have a sensitivity towards being a mother. I am open to, do you have questions? When I leave the room after seeing a patient before I walk out of that door, first things, did I answer all your questions? Next thing, is there anything else I can do to help you? I have goosebumps and yeah. I mean when we talk about centering the narratives of moms and how you're able to take your personal story um, and channel it into your practice and how you're empowering women's moms and women I have goosebumps um, I want to encourage the audience we are having this conversation online and the hashtag is hashtag DC maternal health all of these amazing quotes and things that uh, the moms on this panel are talking about, amplify it, share the quotes, share the tweets, um, and we're gonna continue to empower the community. This panel is awesome because um, you mentioned the role of your husband. We're gonna have an awesome panel about fatherhood. Uh, and Chef Patty, we're gonna have a great conversation later around food policy. Uh, I wanna get to you, Kim. You have a global aim of empowering women as a CEO and president of AUW. Um, you're pushing for policy, for equity for women, um, whether it's pay equity, um, work equity, and your reach is a global movement. How do you channel that as a mom and how do you center your voice in empowering the women that you're serving around the globe? Thank you, and thank you to my fellow panelists, too, for so ably sharing and, and uh, their stories. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a divorced working mom. Um, like our extraordinary mayor, um, I was lucky enough to adopt my daughter with my then husband almost 11 years ago, and she's a thriving baseball, not softball, baseball playing sixth grader right here in the District of Columbia. Uh, she's kind of a badass out there, too, I will say. <laughs> Uh, you might see her on a pitcher's mound soon. Uh, but in, in being unable to biologically create a family uh, and having gone down the adoption trail, I also was really committed to my career and what I was doing then in academia and now in policy and education. Um, but uh, like Esther, I experienced some shaming as well. Because I chose to continue my career, uh, because it was about the economic security of our family, because it was about my intellectual growth as a professional. My then husband was seen differently in his role as a father than I was as a working mother. That shaming is not just women on women, it's men on women, uh, and, and we're lifting up. Unfortunately, too often we're seeing fathers that receive a bonus for parenthood and mothers who receive a serious penalty and I mean an economic penalty. On average, working moms in this nation earn 69 cents on the dollar that working dads do. That's unacceptable in 2019 and beyond. So what I believe the conversation, thank you, totally agree. What I believe the conversation has to be about here is pragmatic and practical solutions so we all can thrive in our society. Again, these are not women's issues. These are families' economic security issues. This is about working families figuring out the paths forward that work for them. And families come in lots of different sizes, uh, lots of different ways of moving forward. I'd also say, as we lift up women in these roles, is understanding, again, that there's not just one policy that's going to fix it, although I really commend Mayor Bowser and the Cabinet for all they're doing to make sure that women, mothers, fathers, and caretakers have the resources they need to help their families to thrive uh, in, in meaningful ways. That said, policy alone doesn't change decades-old behavior. Basically, in the workplace today, we still are setting up systems that are like out of a Leave it to Beaver or Ozzy and Harriet show. Okay, what do I mean by this? That the, the lovely white man comes home from work with his briefcase and the doting wife is at the door with a hot apple pie in the oven and a roast chicken on the table. Is that your experience today? It's 
certainly not mine. I might be coming over to her house for Taco Tuesday <laughs> tonight. Uh, <laughs> But I think as we think about our systems, it has to be more, not just about policy, and on policy it means absolutely equal pay for equal skills and equal work, first and foremost. <laughs> secondly, secondly, it has to be about parental leave, and I say that with a capital P, not a capital M. <laughs> capital P on parental leave. Flexible schedules so that we're working in ways that allow families to live their lives in meaningful ways and earn a living wage. And yet, friends, we also have to make sure we're checking our own individual biases. Nobody should be shamed because they choose to continue their career on mission-based work that they care about. Everybody deserves the opportunity to look themselves in the mirror, check their own biases and discrimination, and help to make others grow. So that's how I think about this work. So you all have given us so much to think about. <laughs> you probably should have your own individual panels. <laughs> But I want to talk about expectations that you put on yourself as a mom. Uh, I know I've put many, like being okay, and um, some of the other preconceived notions that you believe people have about you as a mom in your space. So that's really open to any. So expectations that you put on yourself as a mom, and also some of those preconceived notions. That is a big one, and that is a tough one. And I think that is mostly because as women and working women and working moms, the toughest and most unforgiving expectations come from ourselves. So as you were saying, we get the, the shaming from deciding how many kids you're gonna have or when you're gonna have them, or the accent that you have I've, I've had so many obstacles in my career because of my strong Mexican accent. Um, and also, as you were saying, um, you know, as a woman that works, you're expected to balance and have the apple pie and have the roasted chicken in the oven and do everything. But I think it is mostly coming from ourselves in that sense of not being able to fulfill those roles that are ingrained in culture, in our family, in, you know, from our kids, from what they see on TV. So there is this sense, especially when as a woman, I feel like we are pushed to find other ways that are not conventional because that nine to five job, you just can't do it. So many women that have kids are forced to look for entrepreneurial, small business, start at home, start your own, Thing, which is what I had to do and then when you're an entrepreneur and you build your own business aside from the obstacles that you may face you have the toughest boss which is yourself because you never know when to stop or when enough is ever enough um, so I think those are the toughest expectations and just as you were saying you have to look at the mirror and look at your own biases and exactly you know try to be as humble and kind to others as you expect others to be to you, I think the expectations, how do we manage and tame our own expectations so we can be forgiving to ourselves? Yeah, I'll just add on that, this, this idea of perfection, of being the perfect employee, the perfect manager, the perfect mom, the perfect chef at home, the most welcoming family member, the best sister, niece, aunt, everything. Yes, yes, it's everything. So checking that perfection level, for me, just in really basic terms as a mom, one thing that's really important to me is making sure I'm making Ruby's lunch on days uh, that I'm, and just having that note from me in a homemade lunch is something I can check off on the box. It may mean sometimes we're visiting one of the terrific DC restaurants and having a meal for dinner together because I can't cook every meal, but it's those choices of how I want to be there for my daughter. Uh, for us, like you, the dinner table is really important, a time of sharing. But she's also accustomed to, sometimes I need to take a conference call with people in Morocco. And I might be helping her with her math homework, have a headset on, stew, you know, stirring something on the stove, and she's seeing that. 
but I also believe for our children to be able to know, no, you cannot do everything all at once. I, my eye twitch is going just thinking about it. You cannot. That said, for our children to be able to see that you can figure out ways to blend blend, not balance our lives, really blend them, is meaningful for the next generations of saying you can be a, a mother who is there and present looking at your kid in the eyes while still maintaining a career. The reality is, though, we cannot seek for perfection. We have to make choices on the things that matter most to us and not compare ourselves to our neighbors or to what we see in newspapers or magazines, because that's fantasy land. Absolutely. Such a good point. And um, one of the things that I appreciate that you said, Kim, was checking our own biases. Um, I am expecting, and I, I, I'll be honest, you know, I kind of had these preconceived notions. It doesn't take all that, and it's not that hot. And about three weeks ago, we had a heat wave, and it's like, oh, wow, it's that hot. Um, <laughs> But that experience kind of grounded me, and it's allowed me, as an expected, expecting woman, as a woman, as a community leader, to really take that perspective to the work that we're doing. And my question, um, last question for each of you all is, how are you taking your journey, your career, your life, your experience, and how are you centering the voices of moms in your work and championing them every day? Well, first, if I can go back to one thing, I think for mothers, what I try to tell you is give yourself a break. Cut yourself a break. Okay, nobody is that perfect. The next thing I will tell my pregnant moms, the celebrities make it look glamorous. It's not. Okay? It is not. They all have assistants and trainers and chefs. You don't have that. So it's okay for... <laughs> You know, so it's okay for you to feel down, to feel tired, to feel like you can't do it all. And then you have to take care of you. Okay. You are no good to your family if you yourself are not healthy. Okay. In terms of how I have uh, incorporated what I've learned into my practice, traditionally the uh, provider-patient relationship has been paternalistic, a little bit dictatorial, right? You come in. I tell you what to do. We've, we need to change that and make it collaborative. Okay? You walk in the door, don't be afraid to come in with your list. I tell my patients, have a list of the things that you're really concerned about. And then after we do our exam, we sit down and we talk. We need to end with number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And our answers for each one. We come up with our plan together. I find that if the patient has some skin in the game, then they're more likely to be compliant and they're more likely to work with you. And then they feel that they were heard and they were listened to. That to me is the most important thing. It's got to be collaborative. So I have the pleasure of getting to travel this nation, and I'm in red, blue, and purple parts of the country really frequently. And so I think the number one thing I can do, both as a working mom uh, and as a professional trying to advance gender equity in society, is to have active listening ears on. That means talking less and listening more to what the real experiences of families are today in thinking about education, skills for the future of work, worrying about health care, schooling for their children, how they're going to be able to pay the rent, et cetera, so that we can then craft the right policy solutions um, and real world solutions so that everybody can thrive. And I have heard amazing stories around the country that have helped me to rethink the way that we approach you know, paid sick leave or how we approach flexible schedules in the workplace or how to create better blend again for families. But it's only by closing my mouth <laughs> and listening more that we can make sure we're hearing the experiences of real Americans today. I think, I mean, the things that you all are saying are so humbling and I'm learning so much from being on these panels, so thank you. Um, but I, th I would say two things. One, definitely learning from other people and opening yourself, because I think 
as women, we tend to feel like we need to nurture everything around us. We need to take care of our kids. We need to take care of our home. We need to take care of our husband. We need to take care of our families. In my um, in my case, my family back home in Mexico. So you feel all these responsibilities. So in, in a way, it all feels like it's centering on you and you feel all these responsibility and expectations and we forget to open up and see examples of how other people are coping in different and experimental ways that may not be what is by the book and what you're expected to do and along the way I found that one thing is very very important and it is to of course do the short-term things that are most important to you, which is being there for your kids, putting the food on the table. If you have to travel, there's times that I have to be away from home 10 days to be there present on the phone with technology these days. It's easier. Um, but knowing that on the long term, you have to know that there are certain things that you will never put on the negotiating table. It may be your identity, your accent, your looks, your the way that you work. I think we're all expected to put everything on the table when as women we're trying to work and we're trying to do something. We're, we're expected to just give everything. And we have to make sure that there are things that we just don't put on that table and they're not to be negotiated. And the hard part is that those things tend to be the things that we feel most embarrassed about and most vulnerable for, and again, I'm going for my accent because I've gotten such a hard time with that, um, or where I come from or the looks or, you know, I switched careers. I was a political analyst and worked at a think tank and switched to cooking and I got so much slack from, oh, now you're just washing the dishes and you're rinsing pots and pans and how could you leave, you know, your work at a think tank for doing these? And, um, and I feel that you have to, think in the long term in some instances and those things that you're never willing to put on the table you don't get the you don't get the reward for in the short term ever it's in the long term and you have to be willing to just work it So it appears that our time is coming to a close, and it has really been an honor to share the stage with you, and also congratulations to Jennifer. Welcome. <laughs> we'll check in and see how easy it is for you. <laughs> um, but I do think that you guys left us with some really great food for thought around how to really continue to elevate the voices of other moms. And also, I think what I also heard in our conversation was, it's not just about the moms alone, right? But all the other um, people that make it possible. Um, it goes back to that village concept and dads. And um, as the mayor mentioned in her remarks, some people might not want to become parents, but there is also a role um, to play in that space. So thank you so much for sharing this time with us. And thank you for sharing your stories. And we are really excited um, about the next panels to come. And we do hope that you will continue to share as we go through this day on social media, any stories or questions you might have um, by hashtagging DC Maternal Health. Uh, and you can do that on any of the social media um, handles that are out there. So the next panel um, will be coming up shortly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage 
the president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, David Hinson. Good morning. What an amazing panel that you just heard. Let's give that last panel a round of applause, please. On behalf of Board Chair Congressman Cedric Richmond and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, I'm pleased to be with you today. I want to thank Mayor Bowser for her vision in leading this annual national summit that focuses exclusively on health policy, innovations, and emerging issues in maternal and infant health care. I cannot underscore enough the strong leadership that Mayor Bowser brings to Washington, D.C. and to our nation at a time when strong leadership is most needed. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's mission is to advance the global black community by developing leaders, informing policy, and educating the public. This summit kicks off our annual legislative conference. At this conference, we bring together policymakers, community leaders, the business and nonprofit communities, and thousands of concerned citizens from all across our nation and abroad. Our theme for ALC 2019, 40, 400 years, our legacy, our possibility speaks boldly to our rich history of not just surviving or overcoming, but dreaming and striving for our highest aspirations. But as I think about this theme, I can't run away from a troubling fact. That is that our black women and our black children are under siege. According to the CBC, black women are 22% more likely to die from heart disease than white women. 71% more likely to die from cervical cancer than their white counterparts. And a full 243% more likely to die from childbirth than white females. A recent Harvard University article said it best, America is failing its black mothers. And when America fails black mothers, it fails the backbone of the black community. It fails the primary educators of our children. It fails the keepers of our spirit and our faith, not just for our community, but for our nation. And it fails generations to come. As it has been since the first Africans landed in the British colonies in 1619, if there's a solution to the issues of black maternal and infant health, we will find it, and we'll likely find it at this summit. If there's a policy that restricts black women, in fact all women, from health care that they need and deserve, we will change that policy. And if there's an obstacle, to women living lives of joy and peace, free of pain and suffering, then we will remove that obstacle. As President Obama often said, we are the leaders that we are looking for. I believe that you are the leaders that our nation needs today. I thank you for getting up this morning and coming here to participate in this maternal and infant health summit and I wish all of you great health and prosperity, and I look forward to seeing all of you throughout this week at AOC 2019. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator for Early Exposures in Life, Understanding Risk and Resilience to Improve Health and Education, Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt, Director of DC Health. And our next panel, Dr. Myra Jones-Taylor, zero to three. Linda Goler blount Black Women's Health Imperatives. Dr. Joya Creer-Perry, 
National Birth Equity Collaborative, Dr. Nina McConico, Child Witness to Violence Project, Boston Medical Center. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. We're very excited to be with you all this morning. We have an esteemed group of panelists. You'll be able to find their bios in your program booklet. Um, as has been stated this morning, earlier today, we have a tremendous approach to how we are working to improve maternal and infant health here in the District of Columbia. At this year's summit, we've decided to discuss a broad cross-section of topics. Uh, the panelists that you have here before you this morning come from a broad sector uh, of things that are required to improve health, and we're going to focus on the intersection of health and education. Uh, looking at things that happen very early uh, in life, beginning in pregnancy, uh, what happens to a woman's health that can impact um, both the woman's health as well as the child's health. And we're also going to talk very much about the intersection of health and education and how that impacts the overall health of women and babies. Oh, so we're going to go ahead and get right into our discussion. And we're going to start with Dr. Joya Career Perry, uh, who's our uh, physician on our panel, and to go ahead and get us started. Um, last week, the CDC published a report um, highlighting some of the outcomes that happen with pregnancy-related deaths, uh, as well as what we call severe maternal morbidity, or 21 things that uh, could happen as a result of complicated labor and delivery. And um, some of the findings of that report highlighted some of the inequities or disparities that can happen with birth outcomes. And there's, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about the differences between birth outcomes in black women and white women. And in that report, it, you know, black women can have pregnancy related death ratios that are three times higher than their white counterparts. But even when we look at college educated women, the rate becomes five times higher and black women than their white counterparts. So if you can talk to us a little bit about why that could be, some of the reasons behind that, we talk about something called toxic stress and weathering, yeah. some of the reasons why that could be. So thank you so much, Dr. Nesbitt. Um, can y'all hear me? I am so honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And this esteemed panel, I love every time I get to be with all of you. So really toxic stress or trauma, it's another way to think of it, are those events that happen to us. We talk about it a lot in childhood experiences. Um, there are severe events that shock you, that stun you, that knock you out of your feet, right? So things like having a parent who is addicted to drugs or being abused. But also we know that as black women or as black people living in this country, the toxic stress of dealing with racism has also impacted our bodies as well. And so we, that's why you can see, thank you, that's why you can see despite income, despite education, despite weight, right? So black women who are normal weight have worse birth outcomes than white women who are obese. Um, and so that doesn't say that we don't need to make sure that we have education and, and we ensure that we have all the things that we need to be resilient, but we also need to work on what are the things that are harming us, like racism and gender oppression, that make us have to be so resilient. And how do we start tearing those systems and really challenging those systems in the first place? Thank you for that. And so we're going to keep with this theme around um, what happens to black women and uh, black women having to uh, endure stress or some of the things that happen in the environments where black women are uh, and ask Linda to talk a little bit to us. Uh, Linda has been with the Black Women's Health Imperative for about five years, but has lots of experience in the private sector uh, that she brings to that work. And, you know, some people, when we talk about black women's health, um, we're talking about maternal health. 
Um, but there's maternal health, there's black women's health. We know here in the district when we started having the summit or we were preparing for the summit last year that healthy women have healthy babies. And so we focus a lot on keeping women healthy overall. So can you tell us a little bit about, from your experience from the private sector, um, the things that the uh, Black Women's Health Imperative focuses on, focus, fo where your areas of focus are, and the types of responsible policies that could be implemented either from the government, the private sector, that help to create the right types of environments where we can reduce these types of stressors uh, that Dr. Perry has talked about? Sure, thank you, and um, good morning. And thank you, Mayor Bowser, for, for doing this and conducting this summit. Um, I'll start with just about work. So there's a, a fair amount of research out there that shows that black women work, on average, in the private sector, about 20% more than white women. There's no benefit to the company, no greater revenue, no cost cutting, no greater productivity. There's no benefit to the corporation but there is a toll on that black woman's health. And she does it because of the environment she's in. She's expected to work harder. She's checking her work, she's rechecking her work. And as it turns out, if she were to actually stop doing that, nobody would notice. <laughs> so I'm not recommending that all of you start working just a four day week from now on. <laughs> but, the, but when you have that, that presentation or you're gonna produce something, think about kind of how many times you're going through that and why you're doing that. Because we, we do it because of the environment. It takes a toll on our health. So as Joya said, these women who are professional, educated, are having worse birth outcomes than low income, um, low educated white women. But we feel like we have to because of the environment. So we've got some policies in place like family leave, which needs to be significantly improved. In this country, family leave pales in comparison to other countries. Um, f parental leave, policies around supporting the woman, but it's not enough. And what we've seen at the Black Women's Health Imperative is a couple of things. Black women, or women actually, it's not even black women, women do not support each other in the workplace. So if, if a woman has an opportunity to help someone, if they see something, they hear something, and they know something's gonna happen negatively or could, only about 25% of women would tell her, you need, to, you need to know this or let me help you. So we've gotta create an environment of support and we also have to look at the biases. So one of the things that we're working on is implicit bias training. I guarantee you, if senior management's bonuses were tied to how well underrepresented minorities performed, how well women performed, we'd see a completely different workplace. So when we get those kinds of policies in place, then we will see, we will see women's health and black women's health in particular improve. Great. So, you know, at um, DC Health, we implemented a policy uh, not long ago, about a year or so ago, um, that's intended to support uh, women and families that allows for our youngest employees to be six weeks old. Um, they tend to retire at about six months old or when they become mobile. Uh, so we have an infants at work program. Uh, that's, a, that's intended to allow uh, moms to be able, or parents, right? So it's not just for moms because we have some of the fathers who participate in the program, to allow to, uh, to be supportive for families, to allow for some bonding, but it also facilitates some of what you mentioned for women to be more supportive of other women in the workplace. Um, so they all have a companion, they have buddies, they have other people who help them um, when they have meetings. It's actually very therapeutic for some of us adults who need to get a couple giggles and with an infant uh, in the workplace. But it also leads into some of the discussion that we want to have with Dr. Jones Taylor, uh, who's from Zero to Three programs, and it's supportive of a lot of the Zero to Three initiatives that we have in the district, um, where we know lot, there's lots of evidence about what works um, with supporting parent-child interactions. There's lots of things that we know about evidence-based programs um, for early childhood development. But what is it that we need to know even more about that increases the participation in those evidence-based early childhood programs uh, for those who should be participating in those programs? And what is it that we should know that improves the cultural appropriateness or the cultural acceptance of those programs so we can get the greatest benefit from them? Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel and this important conversation. 
So I'm 43, and I have two 16-year-old kids at home, but I can still tell you the name of my pediatrician. Dr. Dagmar Horvath uh, was a constant source of comfort and security for me as a child, and so was the nurse practitioner who worked uh, with her. And I can't remember her name. I'm pretty sure it was Millie, but I can certainly see her face in her hands. I had severe asthma as a child, was hospitalized multiple times for pneumonia, and I knew they were in my corner. They were even more important to my mother, who is a single mom, poor, uh, high, high school education, and, but she knew, just like every other parent out there, I've never met a mother who did not want the best for her child, but she knew that Dr. Horvath and Millie were always in her corner. And so when I think about the things that they did for us, free diapers, we always left her practice with diapers in hand. They connected my mom to resources. And if they made a recommendation to my mom, you better believe she listened and she followed through because she trusted them. So when I think about the best uh, way for you know, municipalities, programs to connect with parents and make sure that they feel like that what you're offering is something that's for them, I strongly recommend you go to the pediatric practice. And my family's not unique. Uh, research shows that regardless of income, race, geographic location, parents are more likely to trust their pediatrician than any other professional in their lives, which is the basis for something Zero to Three um, has been running for many years. Zero to Three is a national program that's commi or national uh, organization that is committed to making sure all children have a strong start in life. And Healthy Steps is one of our programs, and it's rooted in that understanding that parents connect with their pediatricians. It's evidence-based, and what we do that's different than other pediatric pr uh, practices is we have an early childhood developmental specialist in the practice whose sole job is to connect parents to the resources that they need, do evaluations with them, make them feel that they have someone who's always in their corner. And the research is clear that families who participate and have healthy, uh, healthy steps are doing much better than families uh, are on several indicators, just a few in terms of early, early literacy and early learning. Um, we know that parents are far more likely to read to their children if they, they've been part of Healthy Steps. We also know that they get resources. They're four times more likely to get resources, um, be connected to resources in their communities if they're part of Healthy Steps. We are in 22 states. We're in the district and two sites at the ARC, um, and we're really proud of that work. And so I'm glad that the mayor and DC is supportive of that work. Dr. Crew Perry, I'm just going to go back to you really quickly. Um, sure. we, we had a little bit of a conversation about how we get the broader uh, healthcare provider yes. community engaged in, in these types of things. And yeah. you had a very excellent point um, in some of our, I've, I've known Joya for a while. <laughs> <laughs> she makes a very excellent point about how the responsibility of the healthcare provider yes. to know about all of these yes. social programs. So just talk a little yeah, bit about yeah, sure. how we deal with this and the adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. The clinician can do a really good job of identifying them, but how we could yeah. do a better job of connecting people to resources That's like this true. in the community. Thank you, yeah. So when we as providers or as physicians, as nurse practitioners, as nurse midwives, when we hear this idea of social determinants, we're like, man, I have to worry about your blood pressure and your housing insecurity. Like, that's just so many things. And so instead of us realizing that our role is not to fix housing insecurity as a hospital system or as an OBGYN or as a nurse practitioner, but our role is to know who does do that, right? Our job is to connect the community to the resources in their community. So that requires of us a new skill set that we really haven't learned before, and that's really knowing what's in our communities, knowing if you are in Anacostia, what are the social services available for the people in Anacostia? Not that you as the provider there in Sibley or some hospital are supposed to fix it for them, but you do have a, a, um, a requirement really, honestly, to know what the resources are in your community so that you can make sure that your um, patients um, have those resources. And I think that should alleviate some of our feelings of anxiety as providers, that we can't fix all these things. It's not your job. We don't want you to do it. We don't expect you to do it. Don't, but you do need to learn what's out there and have case managers available. If you don't have them, um, have your office staff. If you have a, I had a small mom and pop shop when I practiced in New Orleans. So my front desk person was my case manager, was my clerk, was my office phone person, right? But she knew everything in uptown New Orleans. She knew how to get the patients to those things and, she made, and that trust that you talked about. It's so important. So I just, I'm hoping that there are providers in this audience that you really rethink about your role when it comes to social services. It's not to provide them. We don't want you to own doulas. 
We don't want you to take them in, but we do want you to know who they are and support their work. So, uh, Dr. McConaughey, uh, along some of those same lines and this notion of knowing the communities in which we're embedded uh, and really knowing some of the things that can create adverse childhood experiences, um, and we think a lot about, as was talked about earlier, what we call the adverse child exper experiences, so witnessing violence, for example, uh, whether you're witnessing violence at a community level, we talk about that here in the district and getting people to understand the different types of violence, um, domestic violence, violence in the home, intimate partner violence, or community level violence, and getting to know the extent to which that happens um, around your environment, wherever you practice, if you're some type of clinician, or wherever you provide educational opportunities, if, if that's what you do, and what could have happened in recent events that could be creating a stressful environment for anyone who you're providing care or services to. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what potential impact can community violence have on a child's overall and development, right? And so this whole concept of what happens to us throughout the course of our life and how that impacts our health and what types of strategies can be implemented at a very early age, right? As soon as we bring that infant home and getting them ready to be ready for school, learning in pre-K, learning at pre-K four, learning in the very early parts um, of their elementary school education. How can we help to, again, create resilience in our, in our children at a very, very early age? So thank you um, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It is truly an honor to be on the stage with these very powerful and esteemed women. Um, and I think, you know, to answer your question, the research that we have now is pretty clear about the impacts of ACEs and toxic stress or trauma, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we know that it can have pretty significant impacts on the developing child, not only kind of once they are born and that they're witnessing and experiencing these things, but also prenatally as well, um, and it can you know, result in a whole host of difficulties in terms of the way that they um, form relationships right, with other people, significant caregivers. It can have impacts on their uh, regulatory system and the way that they're managing their emotions and how they can communicate and express themselves. And as you know, some of my panelists have already said, it can also have significant impacts and effects on their physical, emotional um, development as well. But we also know that there are some pretty specific things that can be done that can help, um, help mitigate and serve as buffers against some of these negative impacts in brain development um, and early development. And one of those things is, and it seems very simple, and it might seem very common sense, but it is this notion around thinking about positive, healthy relationships with significant adults around them. And that is something that everyone can do, regardless of where you come from, um, what your ideas, your beliefs may be, education level, right? And it's kind of thinking about those very early relationships, right? And how do we make kids um, and caregivers feel safe, how do we help them to uh, regain their trust, right, in the world and people around them? And how do we help kids um, feel a sense of agency and esteem, right? And feel like they can, they are special, they are unique, um, and that they have positive things that they can contribute, right? Because these are things that we also know they are, we can call them protective factors, but they're also things that result in um, kind of thinking about our overall success in the world um, and in our lives in general. And so at my organization, we do a lot of work. Um, we do direct services. We also do a lot of training and advocacy work. And one of the things that we think a lot about is um, working with adults, right? And working with adult providers who are in the various systems and agencies that are working with young kids and their families, right? Um, that it's, I think, 
oftentimes we have this idea around it's an individual's problem. It is something inherent, right, about them um, that, you know, may be resulting in these things. And we're missing the mark if we don't think more holistically, right, about all of these things. And that it was mentioned earlier um, in the morning that it truly does take a village. And we need to be looking at all of those systems um, that, that are surrounding and kind of around these children and these families and knowing that a lot of times it's, yes, there are skills and things that we can um, do to support, to support self-regulation and positive peer relationships, but um, it's really the systems that, that need to change um, and need to adapt the way that they are actually responding um, to the individuals and, um, and these families. So Dr. Pointer, we're going to end with you. And you know, many of us um, think often about how to create resilience in our children, but fundamentally we should be thinking about how do we give children and families less things to be resilient about, right? Um, so you've been in the classroom setting, you're an educator, you've actually been able to witness um, how the things that children in, are exposed to, that they're developing some of the skills to become resilient. Why don't you give us some feedback in terms of what happens to children in the external environment impacts their ability to be active and avid learners and some of the things that we need to be able to put in place to improve their likelihood of being successful in the classroom and to be college and career ready. Certainly. While we're waiting for our policy and the world to lessen the burden, we still need to teach. And I think that is one of the things that I'm hoping we all will leave here today with an understanding. I tell my teachers all the time, if you want it, you have to teach it. You know, when a baby is learning to walk, we get down and we say, I'm right here, I'm right here. When they're learning to enunciate, we help them with their words. But when they misbehave, we send them to the office. That is not where the learning is going to take place. And so I want us all to remember, these are skills that are observable and measurable and teachable. And when there is, I call it an invisible suitcase. So many times children came into my classroom with what I call an invisible suitcase. For some of my infants, toddlers and preschoolers, that suitcase was very heavy. You've got, you have divorce and separation, you have poverty, you have what the research calls their risk factors. And I call it invisible because you don't always see it in their written report. You don't see it in the file on that child. That's why I call it an invisible suitcase. But you know what I do see? I see challenging behaviors sometimes. I see children who cannot orient themselves to choose a learning area and be able to enjoy their day. I see a little one who sits quietly in the corner of my room, but because I have so many children who are exhibiting externalizing behaviors, I may not be giving her the attention that she needs because I've, I have the hitting and the fighting and the biting because of what's in the children's invisible suitcase. And so what I wanted to, had to remind myself as a protective factor is, Nefertiti, you can't change it all, but you can do your part. You can do your part. And resilience, what I'm learning from the research is that it won't alleviate every risk that's in the child's suitcase, but what I like to say is it gives them some muscle. <laughs> and unfortunately, for far too many children, they require a lot of muscle because of things that are happening to them that they have nothing to do with. But I do think that as a practitioner, I can teach them you know what, it's okay to be angry. Let's talk about some strong ways you can say that. You know what, it's sad to see mommy leave you. I know that hurts. Let's write her a letter and I bet you she will be super excited to see it when, when, it, when you come back. The other thing that I'm learning from the research is that the skills are rather ordinary, not as extraordinary as we once thought. Uh, Ann Maston is one of the primary seminal researchers in the body of resilience research, and she actually has a book that she titled Ordinary Magic. You know, you can have simple moments with your child where it's just about the two of you. This morning, as my husband and I walked our daughter to the school, to, to the building, she said, Mom, will I be able to drive one day? I said, absolutely. She said, well, can I do it now? 
I said, not now, <laughs> not now. But when I get up, when I get bigger, I said, yes. And then she said, well, I want to learn how to cook too. I said, we can help you with that too. I offer those examples because the research says one of the children's protect, one of children's protective factors, adults too, is optimism. We can teach our children, even in a world where you watch the first five minutes of a newscast or you watch the first, you read the first five articles of a newspaper, you don't feel optimistic. We can teach our children not yet. We can teach them tomorrow. And unfortunately, when there's so much stuff in the suitcase, they sometimes are hungry. And I can't be a good teacher when they're hungry. They are sad. And I can't be a great teacher when they're sad. They're also sometimes worried because the last thing they heard was an argument between mommy and daddy. And that's on their spirit is what I call it, wondering what things are going to be like when they get home. So health for me is mind, body, and spirit. And I don't mean to infer that of a religious connotation. I just mean when we say health, it is mind, body, and spirit. And it is important for the village to teach to all of that. And I think that's a great way to get started, to remember that if you want it, you have to teach it. That is a remarkable way for us to end it as well. So I want to thank all of you, our esteemed panelists, for being with us here today. And we should all remember as we go through this day that if we want it, we have to teach it. And if we want it, we have to come to summits like this to learn it. So thank all of you for being here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the president of the March of Dimes, Stacey D. Stewart. Good morning, that was a fantastic panel. Can we give them another round of applause? They were great. It is my pleasure to join you all to talk about these issues of, uh, about moms and babies, about women and babies, about the things that affect our health. And I'm referring to maternal mortality and, and morbidity, infant mortality, premature birth, maternal care deserts, and the social determinants of health these are issues that collectively contribute to a health crisis for women in America, as we've been talking about all morning. And it's before, during, and after childbirth. First, I want to thank Mayor Bowser for amazing, amazing leadership. Can we please give Mayor Bowser a round of applause? <clears throat> there are not many mayors here that are providing the kind of leadership that she is. And this convening is so important. It's a privilege to be surrounded by so many people, so many women on this stage and others, who are already engaged in, uh, on the front lines of these issues and working to make change happen in a very meaningful and a very important way. As President and CEO of the March of Dimes, I spend every day focused on finding solutions for better health outcomes for America's moms and babies. Today in America, we face a urgent maternal and infant health crisis. Every 12 hours, a woman dies due to complications resulting from pregnancy. Every year, thousands more experience serious health impacts, and 400,000 children every year are born not into a loving uh, set of arms of a parent, but into the sterile environment of a NICU. Nothing sums up the state of the situation that we face in America as well as this one fact. In 2019, the United States of America has become the dangerous developed nation in which to give birth. So let that soak in for a minute. The United States of America is the most dangerous developed nation in which to give birth. So how do we get here? Globally, between 1990 and 2015, maternal deaths dropped by 44% everywhere around the world, but not in the United States, where we actually saw an increase in deaths, where black mothers died at a rate of four times that of whites. That's the reality, as painful as it is to hear. And at times, to be honest, I almost avoid sharing those facts. 
The last thing in the world I want to do is to make any woman afraid to have a baby or think that it's unsafe to have a baby. But if we aren't honest with ourselves, we will never accomplish the change that we need. The challenge for us is to seek the change that can begin to reverse this trend. And it starts with acknowledging how we got here. The roots of our problems today can be found long before our time. Dr. Joy Career Perry just shared a little bit about this, that women, particularly women of color, face racism and discrimination that stems all the way back to slavery. And this is an unfortunate legacy that we have still not completely yet overcome. We're still confronting ingrained societal behavior when it comes to health care in which women are treated with less respect than men and a world in which black women are faced with less respect than white women. I remember talking about many of these issues when I was even growing up. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. My father was a physician. He practiced for 50 years. And I saw firsthand the issues of racism and discrimination and the issues that faced so many black women, because those were many of his patients, especially black women on Medicaid and Medicare, and the challenges that they faced in receiving proper health care. I also saw, and I'm going to share a little bit about my age, I guess, the impact of a segregated health care system. And that was epitomized by the largest public hospital in the Southeast, Grady Hospital. My father committed his time outside of his practice to ensuring that hospitals across the South were desegregated, including Grady. I was honored many years later to serve on the board of Grady. But we continue to face the health, the reality of a health care system that is not working for black women. Inferior insurance coverage, lack of access to insurance, maternity care deserts, the stigma that black women face just going to routine treatment. So as I stand here today, I take inspiration from the energy in this room. The truth is we can't give up hope. We must believe that this is a problem that we can fix. By coming together, our collective power can force the change that we need to reverse these statistics. So what does this mean? Well, there are three things that we need to do, and this is the focus of the March of Dimes. First of all, we must build awareness of the dangers, not to scare people, but to surface the facts and to use them to force change. We need to use awareness to empower and embolden ourselves and our communities. Many women on this stage have really bravely shared so many of their stories uh, today and in the lead up to this event. And this is an example that we all need to follow. We shouldn't shy away from our stories. Our stories give strength to ourselves and they give strength to other women as well. And each of us has a story. And at the March of Dimes, we've been calling these stories hashtag unspoken stories. These are the stories that lift up others, and they are the hardest to tell because they are honest and real. But if you're willing to share your story, we'd ask you to join us outside um, at our Unspoken Stories uh, area, and please share your story so that we can give strength and hope to others. The second thing we need to do is we need to advocate for specific policies that can make a difference. A strong national and local advocacy effort is essential to achieve the change that will begin to reverse these appalling statistics. What are some of these policies? We're talking about important steps like implementing maternity, mortal, maternal mortality review committees in every state. Committees that can collect data, design interventions, and hopefully save lives. We're eager to see these established in every state, and we're excited to know that DC has its own maternal mortality review committee. But it's also legislation like newborn screening legislation, which is actually being debated in the Senate right now, or maternal health, more additional maternal health legislation, which is actually being um, discussed on the Hill as we speak. With the newborn screening legislation, I really don't know how much more debate is needed on this bill that will ensure that four million babies in the U.S. each year continue to get critical life-saving screening. Congress should pass it, and the President should sign it now. We need to take action ourselves. We can't wait for our leaders when there are things we can do without them. The risks of waiting are too high. We know racism and implicit bias are pervasive and negatively affect the health of communities of color. We can push back against institutionalized stigma 
by providing better training to healthcare providers. We're doing that at the March of Dimes, and we'll be launching a provider training addressing implicit bias later on this fall. We need to design and implement a new approach to healthcare, to take ownership of our health, educate ourselves about what it means, and recognize that what the system has provided historically may not be what we need today. That means we may need to stop looking only at physicians as the silver bullet solution to our healthcare needs. It's 2019. We need new tools. I think she agrees, right? <laughs> yes, I hear you. <laughs> Women today don't live the way that we once did 50 or 75 years ago. The system needs to meet us where we are, to listen to us and to respect us so we can put the solution in our own hands. We should be exploring and developing greater use of proven practices, proven methods, like the use and, and the partnership with midwives and with doulas. And looking at new solutions like telemedicine. These are the ways that women want to access information today, especially women of color, about our health and our health care. So this is why I'm at the March of Dimes. And it's why we're leading the, the fight for the health of moms and babies. Last year, there was a groundbreaking report that identified the problem of maternal care deserts, telling the hard truth that more than 5 million women live in counties. In fact, 35% of all counties in this country are counties that lack a hospital that offers obstetric services, that lack even one OBGYN, and that lack even a certified nurse midwife to help women through their prenatal phase and into delivery. This affects about 150,000 babies born every year. We have a little bit of a situation like this, even in DC. We launched our own national action agenda called Blanket Change by laying out 700 receiving blankets on the National Mall, one for each woman whose life was lost last year from pregnancy-related complications and for the more than 50,000 women who almost died. Later this year, we will release our annual mom and baby birth report card for Prematurity Awareness Month, and it will demonstrate that our problems in, the, in these areas are only getting worse. When I look back at our parents' generation, in many respects, it's clear we've come a long way. But the changes and challenges that we need to face and that we do face today are more subtle, they're more systemic, and they're invisible. And we have not come close to achieving equity. And so our fight continues. We're not powerless in this fight. We are not without hope. We know what needs to change, and we know what needs to happen. And working together, I believe we can achieve lasting change. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you for the advocacy. And know that today's March of Dimes is fighting by your side. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Oliver M. Johnson II, Executive Vice President and General Counsel, MedStar Health, our social media cafe partner. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so I have a habit when I speak of typically starting at some other point uh, than the point at which those who counsel me tell me that I should, and so that's what I'm gonna do today. So, so I've had a very humbling morning. Um, I was asked to come here and give greetings from MedStar Health, which I'll do in a moment, um, but I first want to take a personal moment to give thanks. I didn't expect to get what I've gotten so far today. I was here for the mayor's remarks, and I was here for the first two panels, and I wasn't reflecting on the remarks that I'm about to give, but I was reflecting on the fact that I'm the father of two Afro-Latina daughters who are trying to move through this world that two panels just discussed. Um, I'm the husband of a woman who's far too good for me, and my number one goal in life is that she never realized that. Um, but I'm also 
an executive who leads a large team of predominantly women um, who face all of the challenges as members of my team that we've discussed this morning, and so I carry a special responsibility. And I'm one of the eight senior executives of an employer that employs 30,000 people and provides the health care that we're discussing the need for. Um, so I leave here today humbled, thankful, and with a renewed feeling of obligation to all of you um, and my thanks. So with that, good morning, Mayor Bowser, um, invited guests, mothers and mothers-to-be of the District of Columbia. On behalf of MedStar Health President and Chief Executive Officer Ken Samet and the entire MedStar family, I'm honored to welcome you to the Second National Maternity and Infant Summit. I'd like to take a moment to commend Mayor Bowser and her team for once again bringing together D.C. residents, including current and expectant mothers, members of the city's health community, and elected and appointed officials to highlight the importance, I would say the critical importance, of sustained high quality health care before, during, and after childbirth across all eight wards of the district. MedStar is committed to being on the forefront of delivering these maternal and infant health services to all residents of the District of Columbia. As many of you may know, MedStar provides maternal and infant care services, including critical care, in the District of Columbia at MedStar Washington Hospital Center and at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Last year alone, these two hospitals delivered approximately 4,500 babies. In addition to the superior clinical teams at these hospitals, MedStar Georgetown University Hospital offers a wide range of classes designed to help expectant parents prepare for a baby's arrival. These classes range from childbirth, breastfeeding, and infant care to safety and parenting skills, things that we've talked about this morning. Georgetown's Kids Mobile Medical Clinic, which it runs in collaboration with the Ronald McDonald Organization, provides high quality, convenient, and affordable primary care to children and adolescents across the city, but with a focus on those in Ward 6 and 7. Locations include public housing communities where over 2,000 children live, as well as a residential charter school. The services offered by the mobile clinic include regular checkups, sick visits, immunizations, and chronic disease management for ongoing health concerns. And I'm pleased to note that each year this mobile clinic provides a true medical home for approximately 800 young patients who might otherwise have no access to health care. And at the MedStar Washington Hospital Center, midwives and OBGYNs are dedicated to delivering exceptional care to women and their families. So MedStar has a table outside with information on these and other MedStar programs, and I encourage you to visit them, meet the members of my team, and learn a little bit more about what we can do to help in the mission that's being discussed here today. But again, um, I will take from today not just the thought that we have to be ever more committed and ever more vigilant in providing the support that the community has made us the stewards of, but with the recognition that I, personally, as a husband, as a father, as an executive, can take much from this very important gathering and apply it to good cause um, in my support of MedStar's mission. So thank you, welcome, and have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the moderator for the role of food policy, access, and nutrition in supporting positive outcomes for families panel, Ona Balkas, Food Policy Director, DC Office of Planning. And please welcome our panelists, Ward 1 Council Member, Brianne Nado, Dr. Kofi Essel, George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Sahira Long, Children's National Health System. Lauren Beal, 
DC Greens, and Beverly Wheeler, DC Hunger Solutions. All right, well, thank you all for being here, and thank you to our esteemed panelists for being here today. I'm Ona Balkas, I'm the Food Policy Director, and Mayor Bowser has tasked me with working to strengthen our food system here in DC to make it more equitable, sustainable, and healthy. And I am so thrilled to be able to make the really important connection between nutrition and healthy food access and um, mom's and baby's health. I'm also the mom of a six-month-old boy who um, uh, likely would not be here without the impeccable care of the GW NICU team and the OBGYNs and midwives, so I just want to take a minute to thank you. So um, to get us started, I'm going to ask Dr. Essel to talk about um, You've really noticed the connection between healthy food access, nutrition, and your patients' health care outcomes. And um, tell us more about that, how you see that connection every day and how that's impacted the way you provide health care. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I am a community pediatrician at Children's National. Uh, I see patients at Anacostia at the big chair. Um, hunger is something that I see day in and day out, and it presents itself in multiple ways. The term that we like to use in our sort of realm is food insecurity, and many of you have heard that term, of course, just so we are on the same page. Food insecurity when all members in a household don't have access, consistent access to healthy and nutritious foods to live active and healthy lifestyles, right? All members in a household don't have access consistently to healthy and nutritious foods to live an active and healthy lifestyle. Well, how does that present itself in our clinical spaces? Well, I'll sort of paint out a trajectory, what families sort of present with and how they look. In general, the first thing that we tend to see with our families is something called food anxiety, right? So a, a constant preoccupation, perseveration, a worry about where is my next meal going to come from? After that, we tend to see something called food monotony, right? A decrease in the variety, a decrease in the desirability, a decrease in the, in the quality of food. In this sort of realm, we talk about things like the association with uh, increased caloric intake, decreased nutritional value, things like obesity and other chronic diseases that are associated. After that, what tends to happen if, as a decrease in quality drops off, what tends to then happen is a decrease in quantity of food. Who is affected first? As you all know, parents, adults, will restrict food and protect children at all costs. Right? So adults begin to restrict their food intake, and lastly, children be begin to restrict their food intake as well. Right? I, I sort of tie something at the end as well. There's this concept of accessing food in socially unacceptable ways. That tends to be sort of a last step that we see as well. And depending on the community, that may look different. Some of the things that we talk about is bartering. Things like emergency food kitchens may be for some populations as well. In addition to even food pantry for some people, that may be what you see. Parents will do whatever they can to protect their children from the decrease in food intake, but we all know that children still are able to palpably feel, right, the stress that occurs in a home when there's hunger present. Adolescents, we know per the data, shows us that this, adolescents will decrease their food intake without their parents even knowing to be able to share food with their younger si siblings, right? They'll do um, counter, they'll, they'll do different things in order to protect the younger siblings and also protect their adults in the household as well. So this chronic stress that tends to happen in the household, right, that's triggered by food insecurity, is something that really inflames families. It does something that we call it decreases their cognitive bandwidth. The ability to shift and focus on multiple different things is hindered. Why? Because I'm preoccupied with my next meal. Right? Think about how that affects my ability to focus on taking my medications, getting to places on time, and all these other factors that are associated. What we tend to do at Children's National, and especially in my clinical setting, our clinical setting is ran by Dr. Long, who's next to me here. It's my boss. So <laughs> one of the things we tend to do is we practice something called trauma-informed care. We recognize the role that trauma plays on the health of our patients. A trauma that's significant is food access, food insecurity. We recognize that role and then we tend to lean in. The question is, how do we lean in? Well, all of our patients, no matter your income level, no matter your gender, your race, no matter any of these things, we tend to ask questions about their hunger, right? We ask two basic standardized questions that are validated called the hunger vital sign. 
This is a way that we can determine if a family is at risk for food insecurity. If they are at risk, we then try to meet those gaps by connecting them to appropriate resources to fill in those gaps. As you can see, there are a variety of things associated with this food access concern, in addition to a variety of other associations that we can talk about in the literature moving forward as well. Thank you, Dr. Russell. And Lauren and Beverly, you're both really at the forefront of efforts to increase healthy food access here in the district. And we could have a whole panel just on all of the different efforts happening right now uh, to, to do that. But I was wondering if you could highlight a few of those efforts that you think are, are most closely tied to maternal and infant health. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, DC Greens is a nonprofit in the city that works to advance food justice and health equity here. Um, we really believe that access to healthy food is a basic human right. And we've been so fortunate to be doing our work here in the district where we have leadership both from council and from our mayor and, and from our city agencies really understanding that access to healthy food, really that healthy food is medicine. And, um, you know, DC Greens partners with DC Health and with Amera Health Caritas to run a program called the Produce Prescription Program. Um, this program really is on the shoulders, in my mind, of a program that was started um, in the 60s in the Mississippi Delta by Dr. Jack Geiger, who was seeing a lot of patients that um, were suffering from malnutrition. And he, you know, he said, you know, go to the grocery store, buy food, bring it back, and we will cover the costs. And um, at some point, the insurance companies came back and said, you know, you can't, you can't do that. And he said, you know, the last time I checked my textbooks, the exact remedy for malnutrition was food. <laughs> and here we are today. Uh, I think it has taken, you know, decades for that basic truth to actually get to a place where it is starting to become a part of our healthcare system. And I am very proud to say that the district has been a leader nationally in pushing this food as medicine um, perspective. So the, the fruit and veg, the, the produce prescription program started about eight years ago um, partnering with farmers markets. What we have just done this last March with support from DC Health and from AmeriHealth is launched a program together with Giant Food on Alabama Avenue, which um, as many of you know is the only full service grocery store in Ward 8. Um, the uh, clinics that are around there, so Community of Hope, um, Unity Anacostia, Whitman Walker, are writing prescriptions for patients that are um, experiencing diabetes, prediabetes, or hypertension. The prescription is called into the giant pharmacy. The patient then goes to the giant pharmacy. They get a $20 coupon to spend in the produce aisle every week. And Giant has hired an in-store nutritionist to support patients um, doing store tours, really helping them think about how to spend that money. Um, I have to say, this has been an incredible program. Um, it is getting national attention because I think that the healthcare system is also realizing um, that this is uh, arming patients with the tools to actually follow the medical advice that they are getting. You know, there is a, a very pervasive myth that um, folks living in poverty don't want fruits and vegetables. And we know that that is not true. What we know is that people lack the resources in their pockets to actually be able to afford the food that, is, that they want and that is medically indicated for them. Um, and I also will say, and then I'll, I'll let Beverly uh, weigh in, you know, I think as a city we have been grappling together very well um, about how do we get more physical grocery access in these parts of the city that have, uh, you know, been systemically underinvested in. And, you know, very grateful for Mayor Bowser for her leadership on tax incentives for grocery stores, you know, the recent announcement of moving city agencies as well to be able to really secure the market for grocery stores. I think that we also need to be thinking as a city, how do we make sure that we are simultaneously supporting demand, not just supply. Because if we are able to put more money in people's pockets 
through the healthcare system, that also secures the market for more small corner stores to feel that they can take the risk to carry these fruits and vegetables in their stores. And we have an opportunity here in the district to push this forward in a way that no one else is doing across the country, and the country's eyes are watching us right now. So I'll hand it off. <laughs> I'll preach some more later. <laughs> So, yeah, we have to tag team because she will, you know, the energy in this one will just sort of. <laughs> so at DC Hunger Solutions, we want to make sure that the city is using the highest and best use of federal nutrition programs. One of the things I like to say is that wealthy people may not eat well, but they are not hungry. And when I look at 26% of the children in the District of Columbia under the age of 18 are living in poverty, it makes me want to cry. But when I'm starting to cry, I realize that I also live in a city that really seriously understands this and is working toward um, making sure that families have access. We. Um, use our SNAP benefits. We know that SNAP is one of the best ways to lift people out of poverty. We want to make sure that people are using WIC. We want to make sure that we're using the child and adult care food programs. And we do this in ways that are really absolutely wonderful. As Lauren said, we are a model. We were the first state, and I say state, <laughs> in the nation to make sure that all public school children had breakfast. Whether you're in a traditional or a charter school, you have access to breakfast. The Healthy Schools Act works so well, we did the Healthy Tots Act because we want to make sure that the, the youngest among us that are in childcare are also getting nutritional programs. We work very, very hard and have legislation that help us around summer meals. We really need to get our children eating summer meals. And after school programs, we know that many of the schools serve lunch around 11.30 in the morning. If we do not serve an after school meal, and we can get federal dollars for this, some of these children will not eat again until breakfast in the morning. We are too powerful, too good, too big, too bad to be able to have that happen. So we really do that. And the city works very hard at that. Um, the WIC, and particularly for um, this, the WIC program, we have the WIC Expansion Act, where we are really looking at how do we improve WIC participation? How do we provide spaces and places for our WIC recipients to actually use their benefits? What we know is that 50% of our WIC and SNAP um, recipients live east of the river, but they only have three grocery stores. We need to figure out how and where we can, get the, we can get the programs together, we can get benefits in their hands. We need to make sure that they have a place to spend that. Thank you. And I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to acknowledge under Mayor Bowser's leadership, um, two new grocery stores have announced that they're opening east of the river in the last year, a Lidl in Ward 7 and Good Food Markets in Ward 8. Really, really exciting. Um, pivoting a bit to um, one of the most important and first sources of nutrition, breastfeeding, um, Dr. Long, um, can you um, speak about the effect of breastfeeding on maternal and infant health and in your work where you've seen um, the most promising solutions to um, promoting and increasing breastfeeding rates? Sure. So, um, so a lot of people think of breastfeeding as a lifestyle choice. Um, I, as a pediatrician, like Dr. Essel shared, um, think of breastfeeding more as a public health decision. Um, and I say that because what our research has shown is that because of our low breastfeeding rates in the United States, we spend more than $3 billion on maternal and child health issues that could be prevented or decreased with breastfeeding. So think of what we could do with more than $3 billion if we weren't spending it on health costs. 
Um, for children, the benefits of breastfeeding include decreased risk of asthma, decreased risk of obesity, um, decrease in some childhood cancers, and also a small but statistically significant difference or increase in intelligence. Um, so, you know, I, I credit breastfeeding with everything that I blame smoking for. My son is 17, he just started his first year in college. Well, my first son is 17, just started his first year in college, and I tell everyone he was reading chapter books because he was breastfed at four. Um, no, he, let me correct that. He wasn't breastfed at four. He was reading chapter books at four. Um, and that's just the, the infant health benefits. For mothers, we see decreases in cardiovascular issues. Um, we see also decrease in premenopausal breast and ovarian cancer, decreased risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which we all know those are, you know, devastating health issues that we're trying to fight as public health issues that we could definitely decrease by breastfeeding. Um, I serve as, I've had the privilege of serving as the president of D.C.'s Breastfeeding Coalition for ever. Um, <laughs> since we started in 2004, and I'm also on the mayor's newly established um, lactation commission. And some of the work that we've been able to do that I think is promising, not only are we looked at as a model in food policy across the nation, but we're also one of the go-to breastfeeding coalitions to share what we're doing. Um, and we've not done it alone. We've done a lot in collaboration with the Department of Health. So thank you, Dr. Nesbitt, for supporting the work that we do. Um, and one of the most important things we've done is increase mother's ability to, to make that decision. So we all know that mothers choose what they're gonna feed their babies, not at the point that they're born, right? They make those decisions across the prenatal period. And so we've worked to improve the breastfeeding, promoting evidence-based care that facilities that deliver are given parents. So prenatal education around breastfeeding um, through the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. And we have a Creating a Baby Friendly District of Columbia initiative that we hope that it probably won't happen by 2020, which was my ultimate goal. Um, we hope to see every birthing facility within the district become designated as baby friendly. Right now we have two that are designated and three that are on the path and one left that I'm not gonna shame today. Um, but there's only six. So um, I think we're posed to become the first state in the, district, in the nation that has all of their maternity facilities designated as baby friendly. Um, another thing that we've done is include and integrate um, lactation support within healthcare. So like Dr. Essel said, I, I'm the medical director for the um, Children's Health Center at Anacostia. I'm also the medical director for our lactation support center, which is also done with grant funding through the Department of Health Title V programs. Um, and so we have tiered lactation support. So we are a heavily um, peer counselor driven model with lactation consultants that oversee them and then I oversee the lactation consultants. And when moms come in for care, we don't question what they're gonna do. We just assume that they're gonna breastfeed and the lactation peer educators go into the room, see how breastfeeding's going, offer them support, encouragement until the baby stops breastfeeding or reaches 12 months, whatever, whichever happens first. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, moms that can't afford to pay for the lactation consultant to come to the house are getting the support that they need to reach their goals. Um, there's not only peer counselors in our health center, there's also peer counselors through the WIC department. And we're also looking at ways that we can improve the diversity of the field of lactation. So. Historically, there's been um, a lot of old white women that provide lactation support. And the race that breastfeeds the least is African Americans. So, you know, why would you breastfeed if no one looks like you that's breastfeeding? So with, again, support from DC Health, we have a lactation consultant preparation course, which is targeting people who are interested in becoming lactation consultants and providing the education at a reduced rate, very reduced, they only pay for their food, um, so that they can learn what they need to become eligible to sit for the exam to become lactation consultants.
Um, Council Member Nadeau, uh, you, um, we were all rooting for you, watching you uh, on stage pumping uh, on the <laughs> dais uh, a few times as a breastfeeding mom. Um, and uh, it would be um, really great to hear about your experience as a um, professional woman breastfeeding and also as a legislator, where you see the opportunities for best promoting uh, breastfeeding. Well, um, we did. We made some national news that day um, when when I pumped for Zoe on the dais. Um, but what I was trying to do and say that day was, you know, working moms got to work, right? And breastfeeding and pumping is hard. So on Friday, Zoe turns two, and um, thanks. Yeah, we survived. Um, so. You know, it's funny because when you have the first birthday party, everyone says it's a celebration of the parents surviving the first year. And it's really true because it is so hard. And of course, we all know that fed is best. But breastfeeding is such an incredible gift for both the mom and the child when you can do it. I mean, the idea that your body as a mother can make all the nutrients your child needs for the first year is really just mind blowing. But it's so hard. Um, and when you don't have the right supports around you, it is easy to give up. Now, look at me. I am a uh, privileged white woman. I'm the boss of my office. Um, I make my own hours. I can afford all the gadgets, you know, the little pump cups that go in your bra so not everybody sees you while you're pumping. Um, and even for me, it's hard. Um, I spend a lot of time on breastfeeding forums, mostly lurking now, but um, we just weaned actually like two weeks ago, but I pumped for a whole year. Um, and I, I know women who pump in storage closets, in bathrooms, on the bus, in the car, um, in the office. Um, I know women who get nasty letters from their coworkers when they forget and leave their pump parts out in the shared kitchen. Um, I know all kinds of stories about how hard it is to do it, um, but what we also know is how easy it is to support one another if we commit to it. Um, I had a, a doula. Hey, Betsy, where are you? Um, I had a lactation consultant through um, my daughter's insurance at Kaiser, actually. Um, and you know, it's, it's supposed to be the most natural thing in the world. So when, it, when it's hard for you, when you have trouble with your latch or, you know, it's, your baby has a, a tongue tie or something like that, you start to feel like there's something wrong with you as a mom. And so it's really important for all of us to talk about these things, um, for us to have the health care for new moms and babies um, where they have someone to talk to. Um, but, but all of this is critical. I'll tell you, um, I mean, pumping on the dais was obviously our big, our huge moment. Um, but, um, you know, I was nursing on... Um, boxes of diapers outside Target, you know, we, you know, in the, in the middle of meetings. I mean, you just do what you have to do as a mom. Now, one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about, because now I've had the two years and I'm reflecting and, um, gosh, for those of us who pick a goal and, and stick with it and have the supports we need and then we get there, you know, a lot of us set that goal of one year. Because um, at the one year mark, your children can have things other than formula or breast milk. But a lot of us are really holding on till that year. Can you imagine a world in which nursing moms, moms, dads didn't have to go back to work for that first year? And you didn't have to lug your pump parts with you on your back and you didn't have to figure out when you'd be able to take a break or if you'd be able to take a break. I cannot even tell you how many times I pumped through meetings and probably about six months in I would just say to whoever the lucky person was, congratulations, you get the meeting today where I'll be pumping. And you know, people just went with it. Um, but it's incredibly hard. And I have to tell you, I'm so proud to be in the District of Columbia where we have paid family leave. Um, Yep. We have paid family leave. We have it for moms. We have it for dads. Um, we have it for everyone that works here in the District of Columbia. And I think that that makes us a better place to work, a better place to live, a better place to raise children. 
Um, and I hope that um, that becomes more true all across the country. And then I hope that we can build on it. Um, six, eight weeks is great. But we need so much more. Um, so we'll keep at that. Um, I was asking my mom the other day, because she breastfed uh, the three of us too. I said, well, so what kind of pump did you have, mom? And she started laughing at me. She had a hand pump. Yep. Um, and I'm really glad that I had one of those electric ones. Um, you know, it gets better. Um, it gets better. But we have to have all of these things in place. Um, and I'll tell you, the network is key. If you are a first-time mom and you don't know anyone who's ever done it, who's ever breastfed or pumped, it's so much easier to give up because you don't have a person you can call when it all feels like it's going wrong. Um, someone who can coach you through it, who can explain that you're not alone, that it happens to everyone, um, and that, that you can get through it. Um, when your nipples are chapped, right? How many of you wanted to stop when that happened, right? When that baby just wouldn't latch, when the letdown was too much. I mean, I could go on and on, right? Um, but if you breastfed and you did so successfully, there was probably someone there who helped you through it. Um, so that, I think, is one of the biggest lessons that I take away from my experience as a working mom. Um, we are getting, I'm so proud of this, we are getting a lactation pod in the John A. Wilson building. Um, so please come nurse and pump in City Hall. Um, come testify at hearings, um, and you can take a break in the lactation room with your baby or with your equipment. Um, and, uh, and what's great about that is people won't have to use my office anymore, um, although you're still welcome. Um, but, you know, it's, it's these little things that people don't think about that make it so hard that we have to continue to um, work to eliminate the barriers. Thank you. I'll be using that lactation pod next week. Um, uh, Beverly, I wanted to return to you briefly. And when, when we had talked before this panel, we had said, we cannot let anybody leave this room uh, if there's healthcare providers who don't know about WIC. Uh, so I just want to make sure we keep using that acronym. Maybe you could explain exactly what it is. Just set us a baseline. Who's eligible? What do they receive? I think this is really the preeminent nutrition program for women, infants, and children. Um, and I want to make sure everybody knows about it. Please. OK, I'm going to try. So. Um, the, sup the Special Supplemental Program for Women, Infants, and Children. If that's not correct, don't say anything. We always call it WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, and that's what is really critical here. And what people don't understand, it is for prenatal, pregnant, postpartum, the children to the age of five. Okay, that's a long group of people that provide food. So, and they're 185% of the federal poverty level. The other thing is the food that is suggested and part of the benefit package is really designed specifically for that family by a registered dietitian. So it's not something that um, is just sort of made up and has had, they really do, it's designed for you. I really wish I had someone who would design some food for me and I could stop eating jelly beans. But, um, but that's one of the most wonderful things. Um, now also, what we're working with in the District of Columbia is EWIC. Um, EWIC is like the, the SNAP card, where you can actually go into a store. We will have EWIC in place by 2020, for sure. We know that. We're very excited about that. The Department of Health has been just magnificent about that, and they also are the ones that actually run the WIC program. Um, we are very excited about the WIC Expansion Act. It looks at having smaller footprint stores um, 
accepting WIC so that mothers don't have to go to a supermarket, but it might be just some little thing that they need. Um, and they can go into a smaller supermarket and get what they need. And so we're very excited about the WIC expansion program because it also works at the smaller footprint stores. But what we really want to do is we want to make sure that people don't think this is just for a mother who's pregnant, then has a baby, one year it's all over. No. <laughs> it really is pregnancy, prenatal, pregnancy, postpartum, and the children up to the age of five. We are currently working to see on Capitol Hill if we can at least get it to age six. So we know how important that is. Also, remember, you can also get SNAP and WIC. It's not one or the other. People often think that that's not the case. We want to make sure that we are providing nutritional food for everyone. We know how important this is, and you all in this room know how important it is from zero to three. You know how important that is. So we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of that. Great. Thank you. All right. Everybody knows what WIC is now. Go spread the word. Um, so for uh, just an open question for everybody um, in our last 10 minutes, uh, we've talked a lot about there's so many innovative programs happening here in D.C., um, but expanding our lens to national best practices or, as the mayor likes to say, fresh ideas. What are some fresh ideas um, that you've either heard about in other, other jurisdictions or, or that um, you've thought up that you think we could bring to D.C. to increase access to healthy food, nutrition, breastfeeding for um, mothers and kids even more? I can jump in. Um, you know, one of my soapboxes, I have a few soapboxes, but one of them is, um, you know, since the, the Flint crisis, um, it became really clear to me that as a nation, we really expect our cities to guarantee that clean water goes to all citizens. And when that doesn't happen, we are rightfully indignant. Um, but that really wasn't until the turn of the century when the connection was made between cholera and clean water that cities started to see this as a public health issue that needed investment. And I really believe that we're in that cholera moment right now for food, where the connections have been made between food insecurity and all of the diet-related chronic illnesses that are particularly plaguing communities of color and that we as a city need to make sure that we are building the pipe structure that you know, guarantees clean food for all people. Um, and for me, that's not giving away food. It is things like improving our school food, um, tax incentives for grocery stores to open, Medicaid waivers to allow for access to healthy food to be a part of our healthcare system, and Medicaid waivers to allow nutritionist visits to be also something that is reimbursable. So, I mean, I feel like that cusp um, that we are seeing other cities starting to talk about, and we're certainly um, also having conversations on the federal level to make it more clear to states that, um, providing that kind of access to both nutritional benefits and uh, consultation is really something that we need to be baking into our healthcare system. That's a place where the city can really help to forge that pipe structure that allows healthy food to flow to all people. So we have a lot of wonderful programs in the District of Columbia, but people don't necessarily know about them. And so we need to really get the word out on these. And one of the spaces that um, we would like to see is when a mother's on Medicaid and she has a baby, let's sign them up for WIC and SNAP right then and there. So that we're not trying to, while you're trying to change diapers and move kids around on a bus, you're not trying to figure out how you get services. Um, the other thing is the federal, the USDA has an outreach program for WIC that maybe we can apply for this outreach program. And so we can, we do it with our SNAP outreach, maybe we can do it with our WIC outreach so that people know about the incredible programs we already have here. And I'd say for, for breastfeeding access, um, you know, 
In DC, there's a policy that Medicaid is supposed to cover lactation consultants and lactation supplies. Um, supposed to is the operative word. Um, we're still waiting for the language from DC healthcare finance to allow folks who aren't pediatricians that are lactation consultants to be able to bill for Medicaid um, for the services they provide. And that'll be great. We expect it's going to come in October. It's something that the Lactation Commission has been working on. Um, my concern, though, is not everyone has problems that rise to the level of needing a breastfeeding medicine specialist and even a lactation consultant for some things. Um, but there's no avenue being created for the peer educators that are touching every mother that comes into certain places to get reimbursed for the services. And to me, that shows a lack of value for the work that they do. Um, we, we exist on grant funds, and we shouldn't. I think I heard Dr. Nesbitt say when she first took office, like, there's some things that we should be able to pay for. We just need to find a way to make it happen, and I think that's one of them. Um, I think also, you know, oh, thank you. DC has, um, since 2007, had lactation, lactation accommodation laws on the books. I think we need to put some teeth to them because, you know, for us who are privileged, Yes, we can do it, but for the mom that works at McDonald's, which definitely has more than 50 employees, so should be subject to both federal and district laws, which, by the way, D.C. laws are a little stronger than the federal, um, what do they do? So, you know, we need to find ways to make sure that the things that we do aren't just helping widen the gap between those who have and those who don't. Um, so. And and I'll add one more thing, uh, kind of building off of what you're saying, Lauren. So if we recognize that food insecurity is associated with so many disease states, we recognize associated diabetes and all these things, one of the most important things, working at the levels that we've been talking about, um, I've been working on the food insecurity initiatives at a national level for the last few years, and one of the things that we consistently see is the need for increased awareness, and to strengthen community clinical collaboratives. And, and what do I mean by that? So with awareness, the number one thing that providers or people in general, when they think about hunger, is that they associate with hunger is weight loss, right? So people are looking for certain signs, weight loss or lab changes or all these different things. But the most common finding that we see with food insecurity is nothing right? It's invisible. Food insecurity is invisible. And to be able to be aware of the invisibility of such a chronic and a stressful um, factor in people's lives is really, really important. How do we address that? Strengthening clinical community collaboratives so we share the responsibility. First and foremost, of course, food should be looked at as a human right. We recognize that. But on the ground, when we're talking about from this lens on the clinical ground, we have to strengthen our clinical community collaboratives to be able to strengthen that, those initiatives, uh, like working with Lauren. So thank you. Um, I have been a, a huge champion of home visiting programs in the District of Columbia. Um, we've had them. Oh, thank you. Yeah, home visiting. All right. We've had them for many years in the District of Columbia. Um, we have wonderful community partners who help us um, run these programs. But what I was thrilled, one of the things I was most thrilled about um, with the passage of the birth to three legislation was that um, for the first time we codified, um, put into law our home visiting programs, um, which I think is going to really allow us to build on um, some of the existing um, successes that we've had. Um, but we do need to continue. Um, we need to continue pushing on our retention rates with the families that we're trying to reach and ensuring that we have a workforce that um, really speaks to the people we're trying to reach. And, um, you know, we need to keep at it. I will say, you know, we're obviously um, our own worst critics in a lot of ways because we're the ones here doing the work all day. But when I am out um, and about with legislators across the country, they are always um, looking to the District of Columbia for our innovation and, and thrilled um, with what we're doing. And so I say, you know, we keep pushing. Um, we keep doing better. But we should also be incredibly proud uh, of, of what we've accomplished thus far. Um, uh, with that, we have one minute left. Does anyone have any final burning uh, reactions to their other panelists that they w didn't have a chance to say? I'll take 10 of those seconds, if that's okay. Um, so quickly, uh, Beverly, great point with WIC. Really, one of the things that we see clinically is that f uh, families start on WIC, um, and then by the age of one, we see a huge drop-off across the board. Um, and this, the assumption is that families stay on WIC all the way to five. 
but they do drop off after one. One of the things that we try to encourage in our setting is to remind our families to stick with WIC, to go back to WIC, recognizing there's huge benefits in being able to access healthy, nutritious foods to live that active and healthy lifestyle. So that's something that we talk about often as well. Right, and, and a lot of people don't know that WIC actually has a special package for breastfeeding moms. Um, so if a mom is breastfeeding, they can stay on the WIC program themselves in addition to the benefits that they get for the baby postpartum, which doesn't happen if you don't breastfeed. And, you know, it's for dime for dime, it actually is a better package than the formula package that they all take. So just making sure that folks get the word out that WIC does support breastfeeding, even though it hasn't historically been looked at as such an institution. And I think I would just want to echo um, what Councilmember Nadeau said that, you know, we, we are, we have so many things in place as the district and just pushing further, not stopping here, but recognizing when we have clinicians actually screening for food insecurity, which is incredible, making sure that we're giving them the tools to actually help those patients. So it's not just, oh, we found out folks are food insecure, but we actually have tools for them, you know, making sure that that last few inches that we can push there because you know that's that's how we're going to be that model for the nation that we know we can be we're so close um so that's what i would i would echo thank you Just and if uh this was an interesting topic to you there's two breakout sessions related to food this afternoon one um eating right for two and one about healthy home delivered meals for um pregnant women and new moms so we encourage you to attend those and with that please join me in thanking our panelists